the perfect foundation. I don't know about you, but I've had my share of trouble laying tile. Have you ever laid tile? I mean, it's not as easy as it looks. You would think that you just lay one and then you go from there. That's what I thought. It was South Bend, Indiana. The year was 2000 and I was freshly married. I was ready to show off my handyman skills. And so I said to my wife, Catherine, no problem. I mean, we've got this fixer-upper, but you don't understand, honey. I mean, I've got a background in carpentry, and I can whip this house into shape. And one of the first things we did was the shower tile. And I laid the first tile, having torn out all the old, I laid the first tile, any old place I wanted. And then I figured, well, we'd go from there. And you can probably guess what the final product looked like, and Catherine sure was sweet about it, but boy, was it embarrassing. And so we began to take showers with our eyes closed (laughs) and really enjoyed that home for a number of years. But I tell you this true story about laying tile because it's important that you get the first one right, isn't it? If you get the first one wrong, then everything is out of whack. That's what happened to me, and it can happen to you spiritually, right? I mean, it can happen to you if Jesus Christ is not that cornerstone, if He's not the first tile laid, if the gospel isn't right at the beginning, doesn't it really just get weird? Have you noticed that in Christian or so-called Christian movements? If you don't get the foundation right after a tile or two, after a year or a decade or a century, some movements really get weird. And so the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, No one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid which is Jesus Christ. And that's our foundation around here, isn't it? Jesus plus nothing. 100% natural, no additives. That's our motto, our tagline, but it's more than that. It's our mission. It's our focus. We start with Jesus Christ and what He did. And then things don't get weird later. If you start with Jesus and a partial work, That maybe Jesus died for some of your sins, but He's still waiting for you to finish it off. It's not a finished work. you got to finish the finished because it's unfinished. Well then, a year, a decade, a century later, you've got a whole system now. We're going to put band-aids on your partial forgiveness. Now maybe, maybe Jesus freed you from some of the law, but not all of the law. And so then later on, decades or centuries later, we're putting band-aids on a message telling people to mix law and grace. Can you see how if we get the foundation wrong at the beginning, then everything starts to get weird later. Jesus Christ is the foundation. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 2, You are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Again, you notice where he starts. He starts in the corner and everything is square. And then from there, everything proceeds and it's in line and it lines up perfectly and it makes perfect sense. And so that's why we have to start with cornerstone questions. You know what I mean? How effective was the cross? How many sins did Jesus die for? Did it work? Does he need to do anything else? Is there any repeat needed? Did he get it right the first time? Did Jesus really free me from the law? If so, to what degree? Can I really just live under grace? Can I be this free? These are healthy questions to ask at the beginning. You know, I've met countless people over the years who've said, gosh, I wish I had learned this message of God's grace 20 years ago. You ever feel like that? I wish I had learned it 30 or 40 years. I see hands raising even as I ask it. Yeah, 
I felt the same thing, and I was in my early 20s when I started to get God's grace, but looking back, what a mess I had made trying to get God to like me and keep Him liking me. The, the consolation is, look, God's always on time. He's never late. He's always right on time, and maybe, maybe you weren't ready. I mean, maybe you just needed a little time to say, God, look at me. Watch my smoke. I'm really going to impress you. And you needed to kind of have a crash and burn experience or you needed to poke and prod at the legalism message a while. And then you were equipped and ready. You were all ears when it came to God's grace. But the bottom line is, if we start right, then we finish right. Just as you received Him, so walk in Him. If things are messed up at the beginning, then go back to the beginning And isn't that what we're doing? We call it unlearning and relearning. you got to unlearn a lot of legalism in order to go back and learn the basics of the gospel. So this is not about some 4th of July experience. That's coming up for us here in the United States, right? We're going to have some fireworks and it's going to be this huge explosion and it's going to be awesome. Maybe you'll go out to Buffalo Springs Lake. Maybe you'll uh, watch as the fire department does their thing. Maybe you'll go somewhere special this 4th of July and it's going to be a grand production. Lights and fire everywhere honoring our nation. Now that's really cool, but what you don't see is the next morning. What you don't see is them picking up the trash the next morning. And it's not pretty. And so many of us, we chase after a 4th of July experience. We're looking for that next trendy thing. You know, maybe you've been told if you engage in the Daniel fast, man, you're really going to be spiritual. Maybe you've been told if you participate in the Jewish festivals, you'll deepen your faith. Maybe you've been told that if you just get away and be quiet and find a stillness and meditate and create your own Sabbath and just do less, then you'll be more spiritual and God will be more impressed. We're so busy if you just slow down. That's the Christian life. And so in the 80s, it was legalism. If you just do more, you're spiritual. Maybe now some people are saying if you just do less, you're spiritual. And so we flip-flop between this and that and this and that. We're always chasing after the 4th of July experience. And yet Jesus is quietly, consistently, always there saying, I'm the cornerstone. It's not about a 4th of July experience. It's not about chasing something that's trendy and new. The reality is there's nothing new except the new covenant. And it's not so new. It's actually older than the old, promised to Abraham. It's always been faith in God. Faith in God. That's the cornerstone. Not working to impress God, but faith in God. This is not a new message. This is not experience chasing. This is a a pure focus on the Son of God and what He's done for us. Amen? The scripture calls it the gospel of grace. People act like grace is something that Christians have recently discovered. We talk about uh, getting a fresh awakening. Well, that's fine and good if we've seen it for the first time, but it's always been there. Paul calls it the gospel of grace. We actually see this in Acts chapter 20. Look at what he says, that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of God's grace. Man, do not think for a minute that grace is some specialty, that it is some specialization. Grace is the gospel itself, the core of the message. It's not like we get saved by grace and then graduate to something else. People act like, well, they act like grace is cookies and cream and that it's just this beautiful dessert that you start off with, but then you've got to graduate to the hearty meal of something else. And yet Hebrews says, it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by God's grace. 
There is no other meal. We feast upon the grace of God at the beginning, and then we get a second helping and a third helping, and then late at night we eat the leftovers, and by morning there's a whole new meal. It's new every morning. There's never an end to God's grace. It's grace upon grace. The grace of God teaches us to say no to sin. And so that's why Paul has the nerve to call this the gospel, the gospel of grace. It's not a particular movement, a trendy focus. It is everything. But expect opposition. Have you encountered opposition? Man, you, you take in the grace of God. You're so excited about it. You think, well, it's just logical that all of my relatives and friends are going to be so excited when I share with them about the grace and the love of God and how forgiven they are and their new identity. I mean, my goodness, what's not to like? Surely I will be well received. And how'd it go? <laughs> well, sometimes we're not so well received. We have to expect opposition. I say grace and they say sin. And that's just weird but we can live with it. I say forgiven, and they say chaos. I say grace, and they say sin. I say living and inspired and motivated under and by God's incredible grace. And they say, you're just planning to go out and live like the devil. And it's like your men are from Mars, women are from Venus, huh? Gracers are from Mars and legalists are from Venus. That's what we've got going on here. Two different kinds of communication. We're missing each other's hearts. People can't see it. They have to slow down. The enemy has done a masterful job of equating the word freedom with the word sin. You talk about freedom and Christians get nervous. And yet the Apostle Paul said, make sure you're free, stand firm, don't let yourself be in bondage. Freedom, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Freedom is a Christian word. And yet we've made it almost into the devil's word. Do you see what we've done? People are scared of freedom, and it's that very freedom that God is calling us to so that we can thrive in an atmosphere of freedom. It's what we're designed for, and yet there's opposition. Hyper grace, cheap grace, greasy grace. Maybe you've heard even more. Of course, I like to say I'm hyper about grace, and there's nothing wrong with being hyper about grace, but the truth is that at least three times in the New Testament, at least three different times, the word hyper, the root in Greek, the Greek root hyper, is actually used to describe grace. In other words, people are saying, hyper grace and throwing this stone, and yet God is throwing it back. Yes, that's exactly what my word says. That's exactly what my word says. The grace of God is hyper amazing and hyper awesome and hyper inspiring and hyper powerful. And so you don't even have to add hyper to it. It's just grace, but it is that hyper awesome. Cheap grace. Well, Jesus hanging on the cross, blood all over him. You're going to call that cheap? It cost him his life. And it's free to you. For by grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. So it's free for you. And it's costly for Jesus. But there's no cheap in it. Greasy grace. What are we, climbing up a fire pole? Greasy grace. You were working your way up and then you believed in too much grace. <laughs> Look what we've done. We're turning the gospel into me climbing up to God, and yet the grease of God's grace is just too much, and so I never quite make it to Him because I slip down in God's grace. I slip down into sin. That's an interesting analogy. It's an easy sermon to preach. It's just not true. We're not climbing up. God climbed down to us in the person of Jesus Christ and He solidified and secured us and bonded us to Him by His grace. There's no more climbing. 
You sought Him. You found Him. No more hunger. No more thirst. He's enough. Amen. So I think it's time, if you've been flirting with God's grace, maybe you've spent a little time with us and you're not sure what to think, I think it's time for you to ask some all or nothing questions. Is that fair? I mean, ultimately, in probing the depths of God's grace, we're asking some all or nothing questions. Did Jesus do it? I mean, did he really do it? Everything the Bible claims he did, did Jesus really do it? And so we ask some questions about forgiveness. Here's one of them. How forgiven am I? You know, some Christians, they spend their lives, they don't even ask. I want you to think about that. How forgiven am I? For how long? And what conditions are there, if any? I mean, some Christians, we go through life with blinders on and we're just sort of having this nebulous gray view of the cross. He'll forgive me if I ask, but the cross did something. He'll forgive me if I confess, but the cross did something. Oh, I know, maybe my asking is applying the cross. Maybe my confessing is applying the cross, so I better make sure to apply. Well, wait a minute, the New Testament doesn't really say that. Apply, it just says... That by one offering, you've been made perfect forever. So maybe I've got to ask some fundamental questions. How forgiven am I? Somebody says, oh, oh, don't ask that. Because if you ask how forgiven you are, and you come up with that dangerous answer, oh, that dangerous answer of totally forgiven, ah, I don't know what's going to happen to you. I mean, you you might just go out and, and sin like you've never sinned before because... There's been this aha moment, and you've realized the sky's the limit. I'm totally forgiven. As I like to say, yeah, you can be forgiven and miserable, can't you? I mean, where do we get the idea that being totally forgiven suddenly makes sin special and awesome? Where do we get the idea that being totally forgiven somehow then makes sin really fulfilling? Sin is still going to be sin. I mean, in Romans chapter 6, Paul asks this question, What shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace will increase? And by the end of the chapter, he says sin stinks. That's what he says. What benefit are you deriving from sin? Remember all the shame? Remember where it got you? What benefit would you be deriving? Those things just brought you to no man's land. They brought you to nowhere. So instead of shaming them and, you know, sort of pressing into them with guilt and condemnation, what shall we say then? Shall we sin? No, God will be ticked. He doesn't do that. He says, no, sin stinks. Are you nuts? I mean, he doesn't put it in those words. But basically, he says, do you not know? Are you people clueless? Have you lost your marbles? You're going to say that because I'm forgiven, now suddenly sin is different and fun and fulfilling? Like, that doesn't even compute. You're totally forgiven, but why sign up for misery? But can we talk about you being totally forgiven without lightning striking? Without the foundations of this building crumbling? Have you noticed that maybe, just maybe, God wants you to know the finished work of the cross? And that it's safe to say, I am forgiven no matter what. You can talk about the perfect you and God's Bible view of you and your new identity as some far off thing. But until you believe that you are purified once for all, We haven't even begun to probe the depths of the perfect you. Part of the perfect you is that you're perfectly forgiven, period. But, 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 but what about, but what if you're already doing it? But what if I, you've already done it. All sin is the same. You create this scenario where you're abusing, you're already abusing it. We all stumble in many ways. Yeah, but right now I can ask. Yeah, what's the difference? You do whatever you want. You do whatever you think you want. And then you go ask Him. Please forgive me. Okay, now go do it a thousand more times. Please forgive me. How is that any different? 
You're already abusing God's grace. We all have abused God's grace. We all stumble in many ways. You've, you've sinned, okay, all right. Some of you have sinned four billion times, and some of you have only sinned three billion. So you're not abusing it as much, okay? <laughs> but do we not see the issue here? We're so worried about the final product, which we've already engaged in, abuse, that we won't even look to the cross and say, how awesome was it? How forgiven am I? For how long? What conditions are there? And then we can graduate to other questions. Here's one regarding our freedom. How accepted am I? Are there any strings attached? How much grace am I under? But wait a minute. What about the Ten Commandments? What's my motivation? These are healthy questions, and yet how many Christians, they go through life with the blinders on and they never ask? We just assume, we assume that the most popular flavor of Christianity offered to us must be the right one because it's got the biggest following. I mean, the majority must be right. We've got to go with the majority. Is that true in Jesus' day? Did the majority, did they get it right? No. You look at the world religions, and man, we as humanity, we're getting it wrong, aren't we? And so what if we were to ask these questions, how accepted am I? Are there any strings attached? How much grace am I under? What about the Ten Commandments? What's my motivation? Tablets of stone or His desires on my heart? This isn't some deeper theology where we need head coverings and notepads. This is for every day. What motivates you? Who lives in you? What are you motivated by? When you give money, why do you give money? When you do something that's kind or generous or loving, why, why do you do it? This isn't some deeper theology class. This is what motivates you in every second of your life. Because I'm telling you, there's a beautiful motivation. His name is Jesus, not Moses. And we can know the truth that sets us free. All right, here's some more questions about identity. How new am I? What makes me tick? What kind of heart do I have? What do I really crave? What a shame it would be for Christians to go 80 years and never really ask these deeper questions about who we are. And to have just some sort of nebulous view of, well, I know I got the Holy Spirit kind of cream on top, whipped cream on top here. And I know I'm going to heaven, so it's Holy Spirit in heaven and Holy Spirit in heaven. Yeah, but you're the new creation. What does that mean? Jesus isn't the new creation. You are. What does that mean? You're Supposedly, you've got this new heart. What does that mean? How new are you? What makes you tick? You know, if, if we took a dirty, rotten sinner and said you're forgiven and you're accepted no matter what. Here he is. He's on stage. His name is Johnny. And he is a dirty, rotten sinner. And we say you're free. You're forgiven. You're accepted. You're loved no matter what. And we send him on his way. What happens to old Johnny? Well, it, what happens is the very thing we're afraid is going to happen. Uh-oh. Look at Johnny living like the devil. But what if Johnny suddenly had a trustworthy heart? What if Johnny had a resurrection life in him? What if Johnny were bonded with Jesus? Then, that, I mean, that's a whole new Johnny, isn't it? So what do you really crave? Are you trustworthy when nobody's looking? When we send you on your way, under grace, totally forgiven, what do you look like? Are you trustworthy? Can you trust yourself? Can you trust your heart? How new are you? When you can do whatever you want, what do you want? That's what we're asking. Aren't those questions worth asking? Do you want to live decades on end and never ask? Some people do. They blindly go through life with a gray, nebulous view of themselves. I'm saved, and that's all that. I'm born again, whatever that means. And I'm heaven bound, and that'll be great. And they never ask. We are dependent by design. 
2 Corinthians chapter 12 says something curious. Uh, Paul says, Therefore I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in distresses, in persecutions, in difficulties, in behalf of Christ, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I, I think we've maybe had a misconception of weakness too. I've heard us believers talk about us being these broken vessels. And I mean, you're you're, maybe you're told you're sifted like wheat. Maybe you're told that you're crushed by God and then used later. Maybe you're told that you're broken for Him and that how, how precious that brokenness is as He broke you. And that sounds so spiritual. It's just not true. You're, you're complete in Christ. You're built up in Him. He's not tearing you down. He's building you up. So you're the perfect you, but you're the perfect dependent you. You're the perfect you, but you're the perfect reliant you. You're not Jesus. You'll never be Jesus. And so what we have to see is that God has created us dependent by design. And when Paul says, I'm weak, he's not saying I'm broken. He's saying I'm dependent. Hear that. When Paul says he's weak, he's not saying he's dirty. When Paul says he's weak, he's not saying he's broken. He's saying he's dependent. And when the trouble comes, he calls it distress or tribulation or persecution. When that comes, he's reminded that he's dependent. You are a dependent creature. And you're designed to depend on the creator. The creation depends on the creator. But you don't look at the creation and say, how foul. You don't look at the creation and say, it's no good. God said it is good, and yet there was a fall, and yet there was the cross and the resurrection, and yet you've been recreated in Christ. So why would you call foul what God has called righteous? Yes, we're weak and dependent, but we're not broken. We're complete and built up in Him. We are weak, we are dependent, but we're not broken. And when Paul says weak, I mean, really, ultimately, aren't we weak all the time? I would call that being frail. I would call that being human. I would call that being dependent. Trouble comes, and it's a beautiful reminder. But five minutes before the trouble, weren't you still weak? Weren't you still frail? Weren't you still dependent on Christ in you? So that, that circumstance is just a reminder of your dependency. But there's nothing wrong with you. You're designed to be dependent. This shouldn't be a pity party. You talk to some folks and they talk about how broken they are and and they almost seem sad about it. Why are you sad? Well, you're sad because you're believing that God has broken you. If you knew that you were simply weak and dependent, you could be fully human and fully reliant on Jesus, and it's not a criticism of you. It's not God denigrating you. It's not God bashing you. It's not God trying to teach you a lesson. It's God showing you you're human, you're weak, you're frail, you're dependent, but you're complete in me. We're weak, but we're not broken. It's about Jesus, and this is a great way to finish this series together, I think. It's about Jesus. Guilt says, look to your past. Anxiety says, look to your future. What could happen? Jesus says, look to me here and now. Dependency in the moment on the indwelling Christ. It's about Him. It's about His love. And as we look at this final passage, look what he says about love. A couple of passages about it, in fact. To know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. This was Paul's prayer, that they would be dependent and that they would know that God is good and God is love. You can trust Him. You don't have to freak out about tomorrow. You certainly don't have to wallow in yesterday. It's over. You're forgiven. You don't have to freak out about tomorrow. He's got that. Take my life and still you're fine. 
You haven't gotten your life taken. Christ is your life. For me to be here is one thing, but for me to be with Him is another, and I'm torn. I'm torn. I can't help but notice that Jason Henry is here this morning. I, I can't help but mention that I had an incredible conversation with him on the phone not too long ago. I mean, he was in the hospital, and he was suffering from symptoms of COVID, and I mean, it was, it was getting pretty serious. But this man, I mean, it brought me to tears. This man, on the, on the precipice of death, physical death, had a peace and a joy and a stability to say, I'm okay. I'm ready. Either way, I'm okay. <laughs> he knew the love of Christ. He knows the love of Christ. And to have that stability and that foundation, take my life and you still don't take my life. The curtain of death, I'm not afraid to look behind it. The love of Jesus surpasses knowledge. It makes no sense. And yet it's very, very real. When you're on your deathbed, you can't fake it. <laughs> and I've seen the difference between someone who is founded, stabilized, secure in Christ versus someone who's not. Now, faith, hope, and love remain these three but the greatest of these is love. You ever wanted a road map for the Christian life? The road map is a person. You ever wanted a road map? If you're looking for that one thing Jesus is doing, Christ in me, I get it, but it's so nebulous. What's He up to? What's He doing? Love. That's what He's doing. You can count on it. Love covers a multitude of sins. God is love. You're looking for what to do. What's he doing with my kids? What's he doing in my marriage? What's he doing in my job? What's he up to? Lord, it's so mysterious and nebulous and hard to navigate. What are you thinking? I, I tell you this. There's one thing we know he's thinking. Love. You can count on that. Stabilized by God's love. You knowing God's love and you transmitting God's love to other people, there's no better expression of the perfect you. We're weak, we're frail, we're dependent, we're not broken. We are made complete by the love of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we get to live in this incredible place of stability. We, we want to see you face to face. It's going to be amazing. Resurrection eyes and a new, a new place to reside. But we got to say that as far as earth goes, this is, this is as good as it gets. Loved and accepted and forgiven. We don't care if we're in the minority. We don't care if this is popular or not. We're going with Jesus. We don't care... If the majority agrees or not, we're going with Jesus. We don't care if the masses have produced some sort of method to get right and stay right. We're, we're going with Jesus. No more hunger, no more thirst. We're satisfied. We're not going to try to get more forgiven. We're not going to try to get more righteous. We're not going to try to find your will as if it's mysterious. We're going with Jesus. We love you. We thank you that it is so simple to fix our eyes on him. In his name we pray. Amen.